Hello everyone, welcome to Winded Plate Tectonic Start Part 2. Part 1 is linked in the description. I suggest you go back and watch it. I am going to try not to repeat myself here. So if we just start here, as you can see, you're going to be lost. At least I would be. Now we ended Part 1 with writing these things down. These things will probably stay on the board for a while here. Signs that we have plate tectonics in operation. Signs that we don't have plate tectonics in operation, maybe. Here is the basic geologic timeline here. And as you can see here, I put the boring billion that was not in the first video with an angry face because I hate, I loathe, I despise this term, at least from a tectonic standpoint, which is what we're addressing here. I did a short TikTok video where I list as many things tectonically and geologically that occurred during this time just in the Lake Superior region. So this, at least from a tectonic standpoint, never happened. There was never a point in Earth's history where there was a tectonic quietness, if you will, at least not globally. Right? Locally, maybe, but not globally. And I know people have tried to sit there and claim there has been, but all you have to do is you know, look at the rocks. Plus, we have so many more dates now than we did when this was proposed originally back in the 1990s. Now, is it boring from a biological standpoint or atmospheric standpoint? Maybe. I don't know. I don't study those things, but definitely not from a tectonic standpoint. Okay, before I digress too much, I cleaned everything up here, took off the geologic time scale, and I added something here. Well, basically what I did was I took a lot of the things that happened during the Precambrian, some key events, I put them up here. Same thing, MA equals millions of years. If you see four number digit without an MA, I forgot to put it on there, just assume it's there. And I'm also not the world's best speller. I apologize. Over here, I moved all the items that are show up in a time where we expect there was no plate tectonics or something different was going on. And here are signs of plate tectonics. Now, just real quick, I have a hard time pronouncing comatite, so I will just say ultramafic crust, but I mean that. And tonalite trongeolite, granodiorite, I have no idea how to pronounce that, TTG. And right, just keeping it simple. The other stuff I'm pretty good at, oh, Yavapai, I sometimes mispronounce. Apologize in advance. What do you see here? This is a generic cross section of an Archean greenstone terrain. And over here is just an approximate scale. That's all that means. Now these look like big drips and stuff like that. But at one time when they were originally deposited, they would have been deposited relatively level and slight basin. Remember, this stuff is just a cross section. The bluish green, because my green is dead, is your greenstone counterpart of this. It's your ultramafic crustal part, stuff like that. The black is more of your mafic type crust to ultramafic. A lot of that stuff will have deformed pillow lavas and things like that. And the orange is just sediments. Now remember, this, there are sediments here, but they're extremely thin compared to what we see in a modern tectonic regime, especially on these. So why do I have TTG there and down here I have mantle? Because we don't really know what was there. And it's quite possible that this entire sequence was much thicker. And this may actually be something like a lithosphere, even the greenstone part. We don't really know. But here you look at this, and if you were to deform this, compress it, you would get something like this. And notice TTG is here, but not here. Why is that? Because these are intrusions. Uh, TTGs are not true granites. In the Archean, true granites are rare. They're real common after the Archean. And today, TTGs are very rare. Uh, we do get them in things like island arc environments. And even during the Pinocchio orogeny, they were rarer but they're there. So that's one of the arguments as to why the Pinocchian might be an island arc environment, but there's evidence that says it might not be, that it might've been part of the original continental platform that this was, and this was the actual 
collision anyway so we have this here these ttgs now you might hear me say granitoid that just means granite like rock and these ttgs are granite like it's just they have very little to no alkali feldspar or case spar case spars you remember from the bones reaction series tends to form last in these type of things so these intruded into this and this would intrude take that basin and bend it into this teardrop shape we think so this greenstone belt might represent continental collisions but let's compare that with modern plate tectonics what do we see when two continental blocks collide you get this now this is oversimplified all right it's not perfect it's not to vertical scale i get that all right just go with it here so here the scale is roughly the same orange is still sediments black is still mafic things you see this up here uh, it's ophiolite in this case last episode i talked a lot about ophiolites and how they form there's basically two ways to get a phyolite. We used to just think there was one, and that was in a continental collision where two plates come together uh, and some ocean crust gets abducted instead of subducted. The ocean crust gets abducted, thrown onto the land, but it contains some of the mantle with it. I didn't put that on here. But I did put together a short animation here for you so you can see how that process basically happens today in a maybe clearer way to comprehend than my sloppy drawing here. But here you can see we have true granites and these are felsic crusts. These are felsic. We, like I said, we still have some TTG intrusions within this, but they're rare. They're not dominant like they are here. And you can see this is where one plate went down into the mantle. And as these came together, you would get sediments thrown down in between there. And this bit of ophiolite gets abducted onto the other crust. That's basically how that happens. The other way we think now we can get ophiolites. Remember, ophiolites are a sequence of ocean crust past the moho to include some of that lithospheric mantle and i've taken you to a place where there might be some well, actually there is some in the pinocchian it's just is it due to a continental collision or the second mechanism a failed rift type system not failed rift like mid-continent rift that really gets going but more like a basin and range type rifting event that ends shortly after initial extension you can see these things don't look alike at all so why would we think plate tectonics was in operation here that's the question i ask but a lot of people who run models can get plate tectonics to work in this time frame but it doesn't produce this and you know we can run computer simulations till our heads fall off but if it doesn't match what we see on the ground it doesn't matter it's not reflective of reality, therefore the model is not valid. But if you do a collision, instead of having just one collision here, if you do something where you have a collision after a collision after a collision after a collision, you can produce something somewhat like this. And the argument for why these things look different than they do today by people who think plate tectonics goes back to basically almost the Hadean, is that the crust was more ductile then. And that makes sense. We know we had a hotter mantle by about 200 degrees Celsius, plus or minus. So our crust was thinner, our lithosphere was thinner, and it wasn't as rigid. So they just assumed that this would be what it would look like if in a thinner crust with less rigid lithosphere. Now, if you remember my definition of plate tectonics, one of the unmovable parts of that is a rigid lithosphere. In order to get that tension needed during slab pull, to pull that plate along, to get that gravity-driven system going, 
you have to have a rigid lithosphere. And if it wasn't rigid, you don't have plate tectonics. Could you have had things colliding and something going under something else? Yeah, that could be a form of subduction, but it wouldn't be as dense. It wouldn't go as deep into the mantle. It would have to be more buoyant, so it might go down and come back up and initiate one behind it or something like that. But that's not plate tectonics. That's something else. <laughs> so there's no plate tectonics in these regimes. Now, a lot of people who are pro-plate tectonics in the Archean before 3,200 million years ago often cite Australia, but Australia's green belts, and it's important to study them. Do that, please don't stop. And the same thing with the ones in South Africa is they don't do this. They aren't as well exposed. It's only one or two cycles. You don't have one and another and another and another and another like you do here in North America on the Superior Craton. We have better greenstone assemblages in North America than there are in Australia and South Africa. If you want to study greenstone belts, North America is the place to go. Do we have greenstones post Precambrian? Yeah, we do, but they don't look like this. This is a greenstone belt. This isn't just a greenstone. All right, so I, I, these things get confusing, just like this here. And one of the arguments for there being plate tectonics in the Archean is basically oversimplified. It's that notion that we have granitoid rocks in the Archean, thus we have plate tectonics. As somebody who spends a lot of time battling internet conspiracy people, I can tell you that that is not a good enough deduction. You can't extrapolate a global trend or a global hypothesis based off of one or two data points and really an assumption, an unprovable hypothesis in, in the case of the granitoid, we have granitoids thus for plate tectonics. Now we could have had something like subduction and that's kind of what I did here. I didn't want to fill these in with black because that would be confusing. It's still a cross section. And I put primordial lithosphere here. Remember when I said that you could have had some sort of subduction and then come back up as it collides with another plate and then it goes and continues on. See, this, this gets subducted but collides with this, comes back up, generate this TTG. Same thing here, goes under, comes back up, up kind of subsurfacely abducts another piece of lithosphere generating TTGs. Or why would you get TTG melts from a mafic lithosphere and we know the lithosphere is dominantly mafic for the most part in in ocean environments you don't there would have to have been something else now a warmer lithosphere would have created more buoyancy in the mantle and convection could have been a primary driving force of some sort of thing like this or primordial archean plate tectonics you would have had that mantle churning a lot faster. Now, the thing with the mantle is, the mantle really isn't getting any thicker. The inner core is getting bigger. So the, we don't think the mantle was thicker or thinner during this time, not much. We know the lithosphere was very thin. Uh, the lithospheric mantle, I mean, uh, not the crust part of it. That was thinner too, and it was warmer. So convection could drive this thing rather than a gravity-driven slab pull type situation. But if you have this type of situation, if this is it, you don't have plate tectonics. You don't have that rigid lithosphere rotating around Euler poles. It's not there. This, it's this other thing, if you will. And the generation of these TTGs is still a problem. We also get and orthocytes, a lot of them, which are almost pure plagioclase with some quartz in them. And those are very felsic. They're not very mafic. What could have been happening there is in this primordial pre-plate tectonic situation or sloppy plate tectonics, which isn't really plate tectonics, you would have more melts in the mantle at the time. And those felsic ones or would have tried to get to the surface and they would have had that buoyancy to do that, and they would have had the warmer mantle to do that, so it would have been a lot easier for them to do that. So that's one way around it. 
In some isolated places in the Paleoproterozoic and Archean, we do have what looks like from seismic data, a plate that collided with a continent or whatever, and as it's abducted, you know, it broke off, reincorporated into the mantle, the vast majority of it, but there was a relic, if you will, left behind. We only have a couple of those, but that could be a type of situation like this even. Those really deep seismic profiles are really hard to interpret any actual geology from, like boundaries of contacts, you know, you know, between the greenstone and the mafic and the sediments, you know. It's really hard to do when you're that deep, so it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Could it be an actual slab? It could be, but, you know, unless someone punches a hole down there, we're never going to know for sure. Now, what else could have been going on other than plate tectonics? Like I said, during this time, we have no obvious Wilson cycles, although Steep Rock Lake might be an early one of those. We have no thrust faults. Remember, I talked about that last episode and platforms. Blue schists are practically unheard of, just like ophiolites during this time. And there's virtually no passive margins. The Huronian is the first really good documented passive margin. Like I said, the steep rock might be one, but it's so deformed and it's been so mined, it's hard to tell if that's actually what it was. But the Huronian was, seems to be a standard rift like the Atlantic Ocean. The steep rock lake, if it is a Wilson cycle, it's a small isolated one. And either the completion of the Wilson cycle during the Huronian was the Pinocchian orogeny, but if that was actually part of the original platform and actually a failed type rift instead of an actual collision, this would have been the collision that completed that Wilson cycle. We also have some phase two Pinocchian granites that are right before this here. I hope I'm forming a picture here for you of why this is even a question. <laughs> so we still have a lot to learn. There could have been something else going on though. And I linked a bunch of videos in my part one. I suggest you go back there and look at them if you don't wanna read the papers associated with it because the papers are very technical. The videos are written by some of the same people who understand this process. Sagduction, and you saw me mention that in part one. This is an oversimplified cross section of it. I got rid of the rest because what would have happened was you would have had that mantle convection, that hot mantle, that you know warm lithosphere and crust, which were both thinner, and you would have had that. You would have had these basins forming, probably on some sort of primordial crust, if not they were the bottom themselves and you get this mantle convection and you get the crust moving laterally like in plate tectonics we don't deny that that more than likely happened we just deny that it was true plate tectonics or even a primordial version thereof and there is a planet where we think something like this is going on and i'll get to that in a little bit here too but I got rid of the other ones because these would have been slamming up against this in a very narrow period of time. We're talking 10 to 20 million year intervals as our modern island arc accretions can take 50 to 100 to 200 million years to accrete to a continent. So <laughs> we're looking at very narrow time spans and that could be a way out of the fact that there's very little sediment in these things, unlike on modern passive margin sequences at the Huronian supergroup. I mean, it has some volcanics at the base, because which was a rift and intruding at the very top. But the sedimentary sequence is probably at its thickest, about 20 kilometers thick. These sedimentary packages are a few hundred meters thick, nowhere near the thickness of the Huronian or even modern day platform. So we don't have those thick sediments either. The sagduction is an altered concept of subduction. You see, you still have stuff being brought back down into the mantle, but it's more of a drip. It's more, you had that nice basin and now it's being pulled down and going back down into the mantle. It's being sagducted. 
And that also would explain why we have TTGs coming up because this higher convection would have brought that more buoyant felsic melts to the top a lot faster. And basically coming up along these, especially as another one of these came and connected to it. And then another one came and connected to it and so on and so on. Now, subduction is not a form of plate tectonics and it's not the name of the tectonic regime. It's not subduction tectonics. <sighs> we really haven't given it a solid name yet, but we do have other sorts of tectonic regimes we observe on other planets like Mars and Io. Those are called lid tectonic planets because the crust and lithosphere seems to be one solid block. It's not divided into plates. It's not moving laterally across you know, the mantle or anything like that. But this, you know, whatever. <laughs> call it, uh, let's call it, uh, for lack of something better so I can talk about it, let's just call it plastic tectonics for now instead of plate tectonics. And, you know, that this would be a primary vertical form of crustal recycling instead of our modern horizontal form of crustal recycling because the plates move about the surface of the globe for a long time before the oceanic or mafic part gets subducted back down in the mantle. This may not have had that. These basins could have formed, you know, I said one smacked across another. They could have formed as a series of basins and then this would happen in one part. You would get an upwelling in another part to separate it, then another downwelling. It would bring these massive basins together in 10, 20, 30 million years. So you get a vertical crustal recycling as opposed to a horizontal like in plate tectonics. Now that I've given a very basic and least technical presentation for why plate tectonics was an operation for the Archean as I could, <laughs> I want to briefly talk about some place in the solar system that might be a modern analog to Archean tectonics. Now, I went to college in the late 1990s and the first two years of the aughts. And during that time, we talked about this kind of stuff, but nobody really thought much about Venus. I mean, we weren't too far past getting actual radar images from that planet through its thick clouds. And many of you may have seen this topographic map of Venus. The reds are the highs, the purples are the lows. This is not an indication of water where there's blue. Venus has no liquid water on the planet anywhere. There is some vapor in the atmosphere, but not a talk for this time. Now, you can't look in a telescope and see these features. Venus's cloud cover is too thick because most solar radiation that hits the surface of Venus is reflected back down through the atmosphere because of its clouds. Now, some obviously does escape because the surface isn't molten and doesn't build up, you know, without any release. But that aside, you look at these features on Venus and you compare these features with a relief map of Earth and you can see the two are strikingly different. And back in the 90s, you know, we didn't really make the connection that we do now that maybe some of these features are reminiscent of an Archean tectonic system. But there are many scientists today who do use certain parts of Venus as a comparison. Now, many of you may have remember from 10, 15 years ago, I forget exactly when, all the buzz about Venus could possibly be resurfacing itself in one massive volcanic overturn about every half billion to 600 million years. We've discarded that. We know that doesn't happen. There has to be active volcanism going on in Venus right now. We just, with the cloud cover, we can't easily detect it. Venus doesn't overturn its crust every half billion years, plus or minus. But you look at these features, and one feature in particular, Aphrodite Terra, this huge suture running across the approximate equator, can look a lot like a rift. Now, if you compare the lowest and highest parts of Earth with the lowest and highest parts of Venus, it's about the same. 
But Earth has what's called a bimodal distribution of topography because we have ocean basins and continents. Venus is unimodal. That means the topography is a lot more smooth. We don't have drop-offs like continental shelves. So it's a lot like Earth. The mass is close to Earth. Uh, that's obviously the same age as Earth. And we don't really know the core mechanics, not until we land something on it and start measuring earthquakes. But we assume that the liquid core might actually be a little smaller. I don't know how that would work because from my understanding, uh, it should be about the same as Earth's. But that assumption is made because Venus has a very weak magnetic field. But that may be due to some sort of flip in progress like we have here on Earth. We just haven't been observing Venus long enough to watch this process happen. So we can't really speculate on the interior that much past what we see on the surface. So we look at this Aphrodite Terra and it kind of looks like a rift, but not really. It doesn't look like any of the rift zones on Earth. You don't see these distinct transform faults. You don't see these nice linear spreading centers that go on for thousands of kilometers. This indicates the crust is not rigid, that it is ductile to some degree. Now, yes, you can melt lead on the surface of Venus, but most rocks are well below their melting point on the surface. But the added heat can help that crust maintain more of its heat and its lithosphere, kind of keeping the planet from evolving out of a sort of Precambrian style plate tectonics. Now, if Venus didn't have that thick CO2 atmosphere, would its lithosphere be more rigid? Yeah, probably, but we can't say for sure. So there's another part of Venus that looks like a small continent up in the Northern hemisphere, Ishtar Terra. Now there are parts around it that are named differently. But you look at this and it looks like what you would expect a continent on Earth to look like. And it stands out very distinctly from the surrounding areas. It's one of the very few places where you have a high land mass with a relatively flat plateau and, you know, kind of like what you would get in an ocean basin from a continent to ocean basin. Kind of, but not really because of the ridges on the side which we're going to address. But before I get into the details on Ishtar Terra and the features within, I want to compare what we see on Venus with things here. Now, do we have a pre-plate tectonics type scenario on Venus? Well, there are practically no sediments on the surface of Venus that we are aware of, as far as we can tell anything that would have derived sediments from the volcanics via water was never operational. doesn't mean Venus didn't have oceans, just means there's no obvious evidence of it. You could use wind, but the wind on the surface is so slow, even with that thick atmosphere, it's hard to push particles, but it is possible. But basically, the surface of Venus has a lack of sediments. It's for all intents and purposes, igneous and metamorphic terrain derived from igneous rocks. So uh, andesites are an intermediate rock between felsic and mafic. And we don't know really if there are any, we can't sit there and say conclusively Venus doesn't have andesites on the surface. The material appears to be more mafic, but you can't sit there and apply that globally because you want to. So this is a question mark. Ultramafic crust, there are areas on Venus that do appear to be ultramafic. But until we send a probe down there to actually sample it, we can only assume that they're there. And they probably are. I mean, this is the kind of thing you can, you can reasonably assume. But just to keep it more honest, I'm going to put a question mark. Greenstone belts. We'll come back to this one. TTGs, also, question mark. We cannot tell. But we can tell using other techniques at Ishtar Terra is felsic crust, continental crust. That part does not appear to be mafic, but is it TTG? We don't know, we can't determine that remotely. Signs of plate tectonics on Venus, passive margins, 
No, we know what those look like. All you have to do is look at a globe showing the topography of the ocean or a map and you'll see the continental shelf slope off. We don't see anything like that on Venus. Oh, fire lights. Don't know. Blue schists, don't know. Sedimentary platforms, no. Thrust faults, we see some of what looks like thrust faults, but the funny thing is they seem to be around Aphrodite Terra and those other rift type structures, not in continental collision areas. So those rift type structures might be areas of extension while they're compressing. What this tells us is that there's no lateral crustal movement or very little. So if there is a mantle-driven system on Venus, like there could have been in the Archean, what's going to happen is that that push, the ridge push, which would be significant on Venus, is going to try to spread that crust, but it can't move any plates. So what happens is the system kind of becomes gummed up. So, well... To compensate for that, because Venus isn't getting any larger, it's going to have to compress somewhere. So the middle of these things look like extension. The edges of these things look like compression to a certain degree. That isn't to say Venus has no lateral crustal motion. It's just in certain areas, it doesn't seem to be there. And like I said, we do not have any plate boundaries on Venus that we can easily discern. So that right there rules out plate tectonics as a possibility. But we'll just keep going with this. So do we have thrust faults? Yes, but not really, because they're not formed in the same manner as they are on Earth. They're formed as a compensational structure for extension, not as compression, as far as we can tell. Now, I may be a year or two out of date. Maybe somebody has done something on this, but I've looked and I can't see anything suggesting that there are distinct thrust faults outside of like Aphrodite, Terra, and other rifts type structures. Wilson cycles, definitely not. So, we pre-plate tectonic system. A lot more of these would probably be checked, but the fact that the surface of Venus is unhospitable to us and our technology for any extended period of time, we can't really tell these. Now, signs of plate tectonics. We ruled out more signs plate tectonics than we have any signs of pre-plate tectonics. Now, as you notice, I kept greenstone here open. Why did I do that? Okay, you look at the surrounding area of Ishtar Terra, that felsic crust that isn't mafic like most of the other surfaces of Venus, and you see these ridges. It looks like a crumple zone. It looks like what we would see on the Archean Superior Craton during the Archean. You have this crumpled surface texture. Are they true greenstone belts? We can't tell. But the physiology, the geomorphology of the terrain looks a lot like our Achaean belt assemblages in the Superior Craton. Now, this is not my deduction. Many others far smarter than me have come up with this, although I do remember in the early aughts looking at Venus and wondering if that was a pre-tectonic or post-tectonic system. But I just want you to be aware that Venus is a possible analog, at least in part, to a pre-tectonic system. Now, we do have other tectonic systems in the solar system, like lid tectonics, which is probably what happens on Io, and you know other places. No silica body, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, you know Io, other rocky moons in the solar system are free of tectonics. Something is going on. If you're getting an earthquake, you're getting tectonics. Even the moon has earthquakes and it's a silica body. So there's something going on. Although the moon is probably tectonically active because of settling, if you will, for lack of a better term. It's just as the interior of the moon cools more and more, the body entirely shrinks a little. We're not talking anything significantly measurable because the moon's pretty cold as it is right now, but enough to generate small earthquakes. And that's a form of tectonics. It's just not plate tectonics. It's a cooling tectonics. 
So does Venus have that plastic tectonic system I talked about earlier? Maybe. It may be a combination of that and lid tectonics. It may be a combination of something else. And combinations are important here. Now I'm going to let Venus go and I'm going to go into, well, if plate tectonics wasn't in the Archean and maybe we have some sort of mantle convecting vertical subduction type regime, when did that become plate tectonics? Is there some sort of timeline we can produce for a system from pre-plate tectonics to modern plate tectonics? And I think there is. Even between us people who argue there was no plate tectonics in the Archean, we are divided on this as well. I think overall, which I'll get into here in a minute, it's behind me, was a gradual type transition over a long period of time. Others think you went from this pre plate system to a semi-plate system back to a stalling or pre-plate type system and then the onset of modern tectonics or something like that. It depends on who you ask. So there's these other concepts out there that maybe plate tectonics was inevitable but had some hiccups and throwbacks to an earlier system. Now there are times in Earth's history when we get supercontinents when tectonics seems to all but stop. We notice this with the formation of Pangaea, but it starts up again. Now we know there was plate tectonics before Pangaea, going back to, you know, a billion years and to today. So the assemblage of supercontinents seems to put a temporary stall in the system from what we can tell on the continental scale, because that ocean crust is gone. We could still be having some crazy stuff going on in the ocean basins. But I think it's just a kind of calm before the storm. We see it with Rodinia too, we think. Now Rodinia was a supercontinent, but it was less of a supercontinent than Pangaea. And that's why I question older supercontinents as well, uh, but talks for other times. So even if there's a stall in the system, I don't consider that a change in the system. It's part of that system. A change in the system would be a reversion back to this pre-plate tectonic type system. And like I said, you know, I focused heavily on Venus, glossed over the moon just to show you how tectonically dead it was, but it still has tectonics. And I have skipped over Mars. And I hate to tell you Mars enthusiasts, but this is one thing that Mars is out of the picture on it. It can't really contribute anything as far as we know. So sorry to all the Mars people out there. So do I have a timeline? Yes, I do. This is the timeline I suspect. From the formation of the Earth to about 3,800 million years ago, I put unknown. Now, we, from about 4 billion to 3,800 is when we probably got the first felsic crust. It's just here is when we know we had the first felsic continental crust. If you watched my first video, I will often say felsic crust as a synonym for continental crust in this context and mafic crust a synonym for ocean crust in case you missed that. But anyway, so here it's really unknown. And we start to get our first confirmed continental crust like I talked about in the first episode up in the Northwest Territories and in Greenland. And from there to here is that unknown Archean system where plastic tectonics might have played a key in it, as I've called the system. Um, it's not a very good phrase, in my opinion, plastic tectonics, but it for, but I'm not the most creative naming person, so I'm going to just use that. I mean the Archean subduction type regime of vertical tectonics as opposed to lateral tectonics. We get that steep rock lake group in Ontario that might have been a mini version of a Wilson cycle. So we start to see a transition. Now this may not have been on a global scale, this may have been isolated and regional, which makes sense. If you're going to flip systems of tectonics on a planet, it's not going to be a switch flip. You're not going to be like one day doing sagduction, all of a sudden you have modern plate tectonics. Natural systems that complex do not function that way. You can't pin down a date. So there's a range. So from about 3,200 million years ago to 2,500 about, 
we get that transition. We get more plate tectonics becoming operational about the globe. And by 2,500 million years ago, we have all of these things, except for these two. I mean, they do occur, just not in abundance. But we start getting all of these things. So I call that early plate tectonics. We probably had a rigid lithosphere, mostly, and the plates probably did move around Euler poles, like I talked about in the previous episode. But it was a little plastic yet. You know, you're you're not quite there. And there were still some things that we associate with modern plate tectonics that probably didn't occur back then, or barely did. And two of those things are the ophiolite and blue schist. So we didn't have that enough rigid crust to actually thrust those ophiolites up onto the continents like we do today. But it was enough of a system where we could call it plate tectonics. Because having four out of six or two out of three isn't bad. And then at about 1100 million years ago to today, which would be the time of Rodinia and its breakup, and then the subsequent assembly of Pangaea and its breakup, we have modern plate tectonics. We're pretty confident of that. Now, somewhere in here, other people have proposed that we had something like this, moved to this, then kicked back to this. I think that's unnecessarily complicated. I think we would see more changes in the atmosphere than we do. I think we would see more changes in the climate than we do. So I don't really buy that. I think this is your transition. I believe this 700 million year transition was the link between plastic tectonics and early plate tectonics. But that's my professional opinion. I have no way of firmly demonstrating this yet, and neither does anyone else, despite what they tell you. Now, people have started paying attention to pre-plate tectonic regimes lately, and if you're taking geology as an undergrad, and you're thinking about taking grad school, and you're good at structural geology, and you're good at physics, and, you know, stratigraphy, this entire subject might be something to do a thesis or dissertation on. Just saying. My purpose in doing this is for you to know where we stand on this. This isn't my specific field of study. I study these things which make me question the plate tectonics history of Earth. I was aware of this in, as an undergrad and I have been following up with it the best I can, and I pay attention when it affects what I do study. Hope that made sense. Okay, so before I wrap this up, if plate tectonics has evolved in the way that I think it has, or close to it, will it ever end? Well, obviously, when the sun goes nova and sheds its outer layers and becomes a white dwarf, it'll have stopped. But what about before then? And what about the effects on life? Well, as a Precambrian guy, I don't really worry about the effects of life. Now, life may have evolved the way it has because of plate tectonics, but that's neither here nor there for this lecture. So what could happen in the future? Well, I put from today to about 700 million years in the future, modern plate tectonics will probably continue. Now, some people will disagree with me on that. Some try to kick the, it as far down the road as they can, as they do into the past. This seems to be a minimum number, or close to a minimum number. And like I touched on before, we do have some of these type of things going on on Earth today. I've already talked about the breaking away of Madagascar from Africa. There's no rift there, and hot spots like Hawaii and Yellowstone are probably remnants of some sort of older system that seems to be more vertical with the hot spots. And the Madagascar thing seems to be a thinner lithosphere like we would have had in the past, although it is lateral movement. Remember, lateral movement is key to plate tectonics, but it doesn't mean it's plate tectonics. About here, we should stop seeing those things. We won't have any more hot spots, 
and we won't have a thin enough lithosphere to actually do a Madagascar type thing. I also doubt we'll get any more felsic crust being volcanically released up into the ocean crust like we have near New Zealand. It's a whole Zealandia thing, which is not a continent, which we are working on to redefine as of now, and it does not fit. But the ocean floor does have some felsic components to it, which are probably more reminiscent of all the way back here. Remember that TTG intruding thing? It's not TTGs, but it's granitoid rocks, which TTGs are. So those things will probably cease to be within the next 700 million years and plate tectonics will continue pretty much as it is. But the lithosphere is gonna age. It's going to get old. These keels under the cratons are going to start getting a little thicker, possibly even pulling down on them a little, the continents themselves. But the mantle will also cool off and become more rigid. That convection will slow. So what's going to happen 700 million years down the road plus? For a while, we'll have a late plate tectonic system. What that'll probably be is just the plates themselves moving. No hot spots, no felsic crust on the ocean floor, no thin lithospheric separation of continental land masses. But it'll probably change too. Uh, remember, we suspect modern plate tectonics is gravity driven that slab pole going into the earth as the mantle convection slows. As the mantle itself starts to become more rigid, it's going to slow the system. Now, we do have rigid mantles, the bottom part of the lithosphere, the non-continental, non-oceanic crust that is involved in plate tectonics. That's going to get thicker, but the mantle itself is going to slow its convection, which means it's going to be more difficult to do that slab pull. It's a lot easier for me to stick my hands into silly putty than it is into an ice block, but it'll probably still work Well, we would recognize it as plate tectonics. What I think what will happen is this is going to lead to even larger plates than we already have. We probably had very small things, and I wouldn't necessarily call them plates way back here because, you know, well, I guess they're surface breaks. They could be analogous to plates, but not in a plate tectonic regime. But they were probably smaller in the past. And even when we have early plate tectonics, it seems that the plates were smaller. So they've gotten larger laterally, surface area wise, here, and probably will continue to do so. And eventually the whole system's going to stop. It's just going to. Now remember, the mantle isn't really getting any thicker. What's happening is the outer core is shrinking as the inner core grows because it's becoming more solid. And eventually we will have no liquid outer core. The earth will have cooled enough where the entire core will be solid. That will kill our magnetic field. Now, how important is a magnetic field to plate tectonics? I don't know. It probably isn't. But I could end up eating those words someday. But when this happens, that means mantle convection is done. It has stopped. No more. No more plate tectonics. When is it going to stop? Probably a billion years to one and a half billion years from now, completely stop. But don't worry, all life will be gone on Earth by then. You might have some microbes surviving, but the oceans will be gone then too. And sooner or later, if not already, those microbes will be gone. So Earth will be completely inhospitable by then. And it will be a cold, dark planet from a tectonic standpoint. And what will happen is we'll enter a moon type phase where any residual heat that is lost is just lost through conduction instead of convection because we won't have oceans anymore. Whether or not our atmosphere will thicken or thin, I can't say. It'll just be a matter of the planet shrinking in little bits here and there, causing minor earthquakes. Kind of like what we see on the moon. At least that's what I expect to happen. So that'll continue until the sun expands into its giant phase, either kills Earth then, or goes Nova, kills Earth then, and before it becomes a white dwarf. Oh, so that was loaded. And 
I hope you got something out of this. And if you have any specific questions or comments, please let me know. If I confused you unbelievably, I apologize. <laughs> I did get a little technical, but at least I kept the maths out this time. So I spared you from that. I gave you some numbers, but no maths. Anyway, I think that's it. I look forward to seeing you in the future. to Winded Plate Tech Tech. This is like take 20, where there was tectonic consensus. Sorry, itch. Man, I just put you in thought to you, girl. Okay. Now, sagduction is not the form of tech. Really, Steve? But the fact that Venus's surface is inhospitable. But the fact that Venus... The seven, I, I believe the 700 million year, blah, 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 using, nah, nah, I already talked about that, scratch that, delete that scene. Uh, under the cratons, as, oh God. <laughs>